<laughs> well, thank you, Dan, for that over generous but most enjoyable introduction. <laughs> I was going to ask him to repeat it, but. You know, term limits seem like a good idea at the time. <laughs> I am very grateful to PRI, not just for the honor of this award, which I am most, of which I am most deeply appreciative. I did not know Sir Anthony. Some of you think that I had personal experience in World War II. <laughs> but I do know that after fighting in the Battle of Britain, and I re I'll always remember what Churchill said about it, never have so many owed so much to so few. That's sort of the way I feel about PRI. And I will tell you that I am grateful to all of you. I, there are a few people in the audience tonight who have spent time in the trenches with me before, but many others who have simply been here tonight out of the goodness of your hearts, and I thank you for that. Before I go on, among those here with me tonight are my two sons, Todd and Philip, who have struggled through the rains of uh, Southern California, if you would stand. and their mother, the joy of my life, and a busy woman. I always say it's nice that someone in the family manages their time well. <laughs> anyway, tonight is a special night. Happy Thanksgiving. And how much more we have to be thankful for this year than two years ago. It is um, wonderful to think about the change that has occurred and what it means about the changes that will not occur. There will not be the kind of packing of appellate courts that unhappily has already taken place. There will not be some of the other recess and non-recess appointments that have taken place, some of which had to be rescinded. In short, there is a new sheriff in town, and it is called the Republican Congress, not just the House, but the House and the Senate. And they would like to get the people's business done. They'd like to have messages sent to the president accompanied by legislation that will actually provide solutions to real problems, the kind of problems that Harry Reid somehow could not face or could not allow those who were beguiled by his tactic to not face and then fail for re-election. They deserved it. But what I will tell you is that what is truly exciting to me is that now, because of the legislation, that was bottled up in the Senate, we will see it pass both houses and go to the President's desk where he will either have to sign it, which I would commend to his attention, or he will have to veto it and make clear exactly who it was and why it was that the people's business did not get done. But there's another branch of government that the government, or excuse me, that the president has ignored, not quite so obviously as his contempt for Congress, but nonetheless, he has pushed the envelope with the courts. I think the courts, as a result of this election, will continue in their present composition for at least the next two years, thank God, preventing what might have occurred had there been some tragic mishap that 
proved that there would be a casualty on either side. Those appointed by Democratic presidents, those appointed by Republicans, but particularly the latter, because that left to President Obama would re have resulted in his appointing someone that would have shifted the balance, because we are at a tipping point. This entire election, the midterm election, was a tipping point. Not that the future is assured, but at least certain things are assured. Appointments will be made on merit, as you've heard, I believe in that, not simply on the basis of having the kind of majority that has prevented the people's business being done, but has packed, packed the appellate courts of this land with people who were not justified in terms of the workload of the circuits that they have now fattened. That is to prevent the kind of thing that has been happening to the president. He's gotten very troublesome opinions, particularly from the district court of, or excuse me, the, the DC Circuit Court of Appeals. I am proud to say that in addition to having had Dan as my second lawyer, brilliant lawyer, the first one was Janice Rogers Brown, now on the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals. Hell, she could do the work of any three judges on it now. They didn't need to put three more on. But there's another thing to bear in mind about the composition of the Supreme Court, and it is this. There are cases coming that from the standpoint of those who just lost this election, threaten the security that they have known. For the rest of us who believe in freedom, freedom of markets, personal freedom, there is a very happy announcement that I have to make. And I must say, it comes from a surprising source. The Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals I have spent some time in the past few years criticizing most of their opinions. This is one I celebrate and I will give credit where it's due. Yesterday, the Ninth Circuit voted that they would simply send up to the Supreme Court any time they wish to do so their decision that because there is an existing Supreme Court precedent that controls their decision, they will simply deny the plaintiff, the appellant, the opportunity to win in their court. That means that the U.S. Supreme Court can, if they choose to do so, reach down and take the appeal on that court, and I guarantee you it will be appealed. And what that means as a practical matter is that if they take it, if they take it next spring, they probably will not hear the oral argument until late in the year at the October beginning of the next term. But at the very latest, by, six, by spring, by June of 2016, the U.S. Supreme Court will have made a decision on the case of Fredericks versus California Teachers Association and National Education Association. <laughs> and a state that used to have the best public schools in the nation and now has some of the worst will no longer be confronted with the California Teachers Association and their ability under this state's law to compel and extract involuntary political contributions, which has made CTA and the other government worker unions in this state. The engine, financial engine of the Democratic Party, and for that matter, much of the rest of the country, and it will mean that no longer will they have endless money to spend an inexhaustible financial tap which they will use to outspend their Republican opponents because, by the way, the money that they extract 
from the paychecks of the dues-paying members is largely for political purposes. It is not so advertised. Instead, it is supposed to compensate the union for the costs of conducting collective bargaining. That is peanuts. The big chunk that they take from the people who earn the money every month goes to build a political war chest in which the people who have earned it have zero say. I am fully expecting that the U.S. Supreme Court will follow the lead that Justice <clears throat> Alicio, excuse me, Alito gave in the California case, Knox versus SEIU, in which the justice found that to take a man or woman's money from his check without his or her consent for political purposes is in fact a violation of their fundamental right under the First Amendment because the First Amendment is to guarantee free speech. The law in California guarantees compelled speech. I will just say this, there's already been reference paid by Sally to Professor Gruber, <laughs> otherwise known as Dr. Transparency. <laughs> well, he has been some trans somewhat transparent recently. Isn't it pat more than passing strange that the President of the United States, the former Speaker of the House, and now the about to be former majority leader of the United States Senate, have this difficulty somehow in placing him. <laughs> very strange, it's very difficult for them to place him even though they have all repeatedly referenced him as the indisputable authority on the goodness, the credibility, the efficacy of Obamacare to which Sally Pipes has repeatedly given a very strong Bronx cheer. <laughs> By the way, I don't think it be, needs to be said by this audience, but I am gonna say something. No one has been quite so clear, quite so forceful as Sally Pipes in pointing out the deception and the unfairness to the American people that will be wrought by Obamacare. But if you do find it passing strange that these people in high places have difficulty remembering so memorable a fellow as Professor Gruber, just wait until 16, watch Hillary's selective amnesia. <laughs> you know, it does have to be selective. She can't quite forget the man who appointed her as his Secretary of State, but she will remember with great clarity all the issues upon which they disagreed. And if you don't believe it, ask Mary Landrieu. <laughs> I will just conclude because I want to hear Britt Hume. And by the way, this Thanksgiving, I'm going to toast not only the midterm elections, not only the Republican House and Senate, but also separation of powers, and I thank you, Sir Antony, for not only defending Britain, but also defending freedom all over the world. It's a wonderful thing that the first of the think tanks that he started was this one. As Howard Leach said many years ago, this one fights way above its weight, and that's true. And one of the things that I predict is another consequence of this midterm election is that when the U.S. Supreme Court decides that it is not fair for people who earn the money to have taken from their check without their consent, it is an opportunity for this think tank, for Pacific Research Institute, to do what they've been doing so well for so many years on education reform, energy reform, and certainly health care reform, 
they fight so far above their weight, they are remarkable. They get a rem we get a remarkable return on our investment. And the impact, as well as the role, but the impact that this organization is going to have in the future will be greatly magnified when, in fact, teachers, firemen, police officers can decide whether they want to contribute. We should contribute on our behalf and their behalf to make certain that the voice of this marvelous organization is heard far and wide, not just in California, but beyond its borders. So I will raise a toast to those who have made this important thing possible. And Britt, I'm going to make, raise a toast to our dear friend Roger Ailes, who had the genius to create a network that lives by the slogan, fair, balanced, and unafraid, and to bring to people like Charles Krauthammer and Brett Hume the ability to be as incisive, as forthright, and as courageous as they are every time I watch Fox News. Thank you all. Bless you.